So welcome to lecture three on genome assembly. I'd like to acknowledge that many of the slides for this lecture are from Ben Langmead. As usual, don't distribute this set of materials outside of the class. And so the main learning objectives for this particular lecture is to really understand why the problem of genome assembly is hard and really where does it fail. And, um, and basically we want to understand what types of sequences are you know, the easiest to assemble and also which types of sequences are the most difficult to assemble. Um, and so, you know, I'll basically step you through the process of asking basic questions like how do you even detect assembly problems? Um, and so to do that, we will basically uh, introduce the concept of graphs, uh, which are a particular type of visualization tool that makes visualizing assemblies uh, easier, or at least certain aspects of assemblies, assemblies easier. Um, the main kind of graph that we'll talk about is what's called an overlap graph. Uh, and I'll discuss in more detail in a few slides what exactly those things are. And the reason why these overlap graphs are important is because cycles in these overlap graphs basically tell you something about repetitive sequences, which are a certain type of se sequence that um, you know confound assemblers the most. And so uh, some of the goals that uh, I want you to take away from this lecture are basically, you know, how do you read like an overlap graph and um, how can you identify uh, contigs or repetitive sequences from overlap graphs? Um, and finally, we'll talk about strategies for linking contigs. And so um, when you run an assembly, oftentimes you won't be able to assemble a single genomic sequence. You will oftentimes get what's called what are called contigs, and so we'll have to discuss, you know, how do we, what strategies can you use to at least figure out what the order of these uh, contigs are in, a, in an actual genome sequence. And so as I mentioned in the previous lecture, um, the two main assembly related problems are basically de novo assembly, where your goal is to basically just assemble a genome sequence de novo uh, that you've never seen before, or uh, there's also the version of the problem called resequencing, where the goal is mostly to um, detect differences between a new individual that you're trying to sequence and a reference assembly you might have from some other individual of that uh, species. And so resequencing is generally easier than de novo assembly because you have some reference genome to work with. And so generally speaking, you're only looking for differences uh, between your current genome and your reference as opposed to de novo assembly where you have to figure out you know the whole, everything about the genome from just one you know just from your own sequencing runs and so the general process of assembly basically boils down to number one uh, just like we talked about in the previous lecture you have to take your genome you have to fragment it into smaller pieces you have to sequence it and basically get a bunch of reads whether you know, those are from your short read or long read sequencing technologies. At the end of the day, both of those set of technologies give you a set of reads. And then the assembly problem is basically problem or basically uh, described by points number two through four. So after you sequence your reads, the first thing that you generally do is you take your reads and you figure out which reads came from generally the same region of the genome. And so the underlying idea is that um, you know, if two reads share a lot of sequence overlap, so if the end or what's called the suffix of one read has a lot of overlap with the prefix or the starting of another read, then those two reads are likely to be overlapping uh, in the actual genome sequence. So they're likely to have come from the same position on the genome sequence. And so generally speaking, the bigger that overlap is, the more certain you are that they that those two reads came from the same region of the genome. And so uh, basically in step three, you construct what's called an overlap graph. So in an overlap graph, uh, and I'll describe these in more detail, but basically the circles represent individual reads that you've sequenced, and an arrow leads from one, se from one read to another if the ending, or again the suffix of one read, overlaps the start or the prefix of another read. And so based on these graphs that you can generate, you can basically identify contigs or what are basically, which basically stands for a contiguous sequence, which basically refers to regions of the genome that are kind of unambiguously 
you know, one definitive segment of the original genome sequence. Um, and then in step four, basically the idea is that once you've identified all of your contigs uh, in the genome of interest, then you basically assemble them into what are called scaffolds. And so scaffolds are basically just a collection of contigs or a collection of continuous DNA sequences that you've assembled, where now you've somehow been able to order them in terms of being able to say, okay, even though I don't know how I, I don't know the full genome sequence uh, of this organism. I might at least be able to order, okay, say contact one is the first one, contact two is the second one, and so on and so on, in sort of linear DNA sequence space. And so here's a slightly more uh, concrete example of what exactly happens during assembly. And so again, uh, colored in red at the top, you see a hypothetical input genome sequence. Um, and the general idea is that, uh, through shotgun sequencing, for example, you're taking that input, uh, genome sequence and you're randomly fragmenting it into many different pieces. And so because you oftentimes usually start with more than one copy of the genome by, uh, you know, collecting DNA from across multiple cells, for example, uh, you can fragment different genomes in different random places. And so what you might end up hypothetically having is uh, the set of fragments uh, in blue on the bottom of the slide, where basically the genome has been fragmented in different random places. And so you're, the idea is that you take these fragments and then you push it through uh, one of your standard sequencing technologies. And then those are the reads, you know, in this particular example, suppose that you're doing super long read sequencing and suppose that the reads you get are those fragments you see at the bottom. And so here's a concrete example of the problem that assembly is trying to solve. And so again, suppose in red, you have the original genome sequence that you're trying to sequence. And suppose in blue are the reads uh, corresponding to fragments of that original genome that you've sequenced through, for example, long read sequencing. And so the task again is basically to answer the question, if you only know this you know, the sequence of the fragments in blue, can you figure out what the original genome sequence was uh, in red? And so the point of this slide is that this is a really easy problem if you know where each fragment uh, of DNA came from in terms of their original position on the genome. Uh, and so hypothetically in this diagram, if we knew uh, where each read originated from in the original sequence, then uh, you could basically determine the order of these fragments. And by looking uh, and, you know, essentially you could line up the reads as I have uh, done for you in this diagram. And then you could basically just read the sequence left to right uh, by looking at the reads on the bottom in blue and then slowly moving to the reads on the top in blue. And so what makes assembly really hard is that obviously you don't know the genome sequence of the thing you're sequencing, you know, for de novo assembly anyways, ahead of time. And so all you have are these reads in blue or these fragments in blue, and you're trying to reconstruct the genome sequence in red without knowing where in the original genome each fragment came from. And so uh, there's a few key concepts that uh, you'll need to know in order to really understand how assembly works. And the first term is, is basically coverage, right? And so when people talk about coverage, uh, usually they're talking about average coverage. So this is, this is basically the average number of reads that cover a position in the genome. And so this is pretty easy to compute. So suppose that your original genome is, you know, somewhere on the order of 35 bases and the total number of bases that you've sequenced, so in this case, the total number of bases uh, colored in blue is 177 bases, then your average coverage is just 177 over 35, which is about seven times. And so in this hypothetical example, our coverage is seven times. And so some questions that you really want to think about as you're watching this video is, for example, number one, you know, why do you want to sequence a genome at higher than one times coverage? 
right? So if you want to do a decent job uh, sequencing a genome, oftentimes you want to do something like, say, like 50 or 100 times coverage, uh, which is obviously a lot more than one and is a lot more expensive than just doing one times coverage. But what, you know, what do you think is the benefit of doing, say, 100 times or 1,000 times coverage versus one? Right, and so the second thing you want to think about is, um, you know, in the previous lecture, I was basically discussing a little bit about sequence bias. And so certain types of technologies tend to have certain bias. So, for example, Illumina sequencing by synthesis tends to bias against GC rich and GC poor regions. Um, and so how does that affect how does that affect the value of knowing the coverage uh, of your particular sequencing experiment. So if I say, say for example, I'm sequencing a genome that has ton has a ton of GC rich regions. If that's the case, then does having 1,000 times coverage really make me certain about um, the quality of my assembly at all regions of the genome, or does it not? Um, and the comp a related question is, well, does sequencing at higher coverage always help, right? So if you're using uh, Illumina, for example, and you have a super GC rich genome, you know, does, if you could, you know, if you had the money to sequence it, say 10,000 times coverage, does that, does that actually help you? Or when does, when does it not help you? So again, just to emphasize this, the principle of assembly is that, uh, if you have, say, for example, two reads, read A and read B, and the suffix or the ending of read A is pretty strongly sequence identical to the prefix or the start of read B, then this gives you confidence that reads A and B come from the same region of the genome, and uh, read A is basically followed by read B. Um, you know, accounting for the overlap between A and B um, on the genome. And so this is better illustrated by the diagram on the bottom of the slide where you can see that read A uh, comes before read B on the genome, even though they overlap a little bit. And so even when you uh, don't have... Uh, you know, segmental duplications or things like this. Um, assembly can still be hard because when you're trying to match up, say, these read A and read B cases where they strongly overlap so that you can assume they come from the same region of the genome, uh, you have to, this matching process or this so-called alignment process that we'll talk about later uh, has to be a little bit flexible. And it has to be flexible because even if read A and B come from the same region of the genome, uh, there can still be differences between them in the sequence. And so there's a few reasons why they can be, there can be differences in the sequence. So the first one would be sequencing error, right? And so we know that, for example, um, Illumina has an error rate of you know, less than 5% on average. Um, and so what that means is that you know, your reads don't perfectly match what the original genome sequence looked like. And so if you have sequencing errors, that means that, you know, even if read A and B come from the same region of the genome, you can still have random differences between them. Um, <clears throat> the second source of differences is really in differences between the inherited copies of a chromosome. And so humans are diploid, and so we have two copies of every chromosome. And so if you have, for example, like a SNP, or a single nucleotide variant uh, that differs between the maternal and paternal chromosomes, then that's going to manifest itself as sequence differences uh, at that particular position in read A and B and all of the other reads that map to that same locus. 